Um, today I want to speak to you, though, about your identity as followers of Jesus. Um, something called new creation theology. I'm going to get a little the- theological with you today. There, I, I'm scratching an itch almost, you guys, because I was going to actually give this talk to like on Easter Sunday. The Lord put this word on my heart about new creation th- theology on Easter Sunday. And, and as I started to prepare and craft the word, it just, I, the, I knew it wasn't for Easter. It was actually for the dream team. And so, so I had to table it, and this is like what God, it, but, but it is going to be a theological, a little bit theological. Are you guys okay with doing some theology tonight? Okay. A little bit different of a, of a dream team rally, but I, this is so important that you would understand who you are in Christ, the, the new creation that is made possible through Christ. Listen, it's not just a future hope. It is a present reality that, that is already being experienced in those who have been born again and who have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, now, now that we have the indwelling and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we are called to live in a, in a way, we are called to live with the transformative power of God. When I surrendered my life to Christ, years ago, you guys, I was uh, 13 years old when I surrendered my life to Christ. The, but when I, when I surrendered my life to Christ, I, I needed a fresh start. And it wasn't even, like, let's get real. When I surrendered my life to Christ at 13, I lived all throughout high school and wandered, okay? But when, so when I really surrendered at 20 years old, him, you know what I'm talking about, okay? When I lived some life and made some mistakes and stuff, I absolutely needed a fresh start. I needed, like, that clean slate that was promised and that forgiveness, that, that white as wool, that as far as the east is from the west, I was like, I needed this because I had made a mess of my life. I was addicted to drugs. I had tried selling drugs at one point. Wasn't any good at it because I got high on my own supply. This ain't getting recorded. So, <laughs> so I was a mess. I tried so many things to satisfy and fulfill life and, and find meaning and significance and just nothing, nothing. Depressed couldn't fake it anymore, you guys. It, so, so when I heard an evangelist preaching the gospel, the, the 13-year-old Jason reminded me of, of, of truth, of what I was really missing. And, and it was at a point in my life, like I said, I, I needed, I needed the fresh start. I had burned so many bridges hurt so many people, made a mess of my life, and made a mess of, I felt like everything. So this was a, a very appealing gospel. And not, only, not only was it that I needed a fresh start and a clean slate, I needed an identity. I, didn't, I was not raised with my father. My mother was, was not present. I had, there was brothers I lived with that had three different fathers. There was no cultural, traditional, this is who we are. This is where your tradition is. This is who your family had. There was no attachment to any form of identity. Am I Hispanic? Am I Arabic? Am I white? Are we this? Are we, are, what kind of religion are we? What faith are we? There was, there was just absolutely nothing, no identifiers for me. 20 years old, didn't know who the heck I was. And so when I heard this gospel, when I heard that, that God created me for a purpose, when I heard that I had meaning and value and identity in him, this was, I, I, I laid it all down. I don't even know this Give me that. Give me. So when, you, when, when I would read the Bible and I would read what the Word of God says about who we are and, and our identity, and, and, and it, it filled an already empty soul, an empty vacuum in my life. And I just was, I don't know, foolish enough to believe everything to go, okay, that's it. That's who I am. I am that. I am that. I am that. I am that. That's me. That's me. That's my identity. It's who you say I am. It's who you say I am. I, I need that. But I quickly realized as I was following Jesus and started going to church and then doing different, you know, church things, there were many people who didn't shed something to become a Christ follower. They just assimilated Christ into their life. Like they added Jesus, but they never surrendered to Jesus. And, and Jesus didn't simply come to establish a religion. 
or a way of life or even to make our lives better or more meaningful. Jesus came to transform us. Okay? So if you're like me, this is the dream team. So if you're like me, when I started serving God, um, not everyone was happy about it around me. And some people were um, mad about it. They thought I prioritized the church. They thought that I was giving too much, serving too much, being there too much. And, and when I started tithing, again, I just, if it's in there, I'm believing. I'm like, yep, that's it. That's it. You guys, if the Lord said the 50% of it is mine, I would have done it because I was just like, this is it. That's it. I'm running the play, God. Whatever. So I was just like, go. That's all I'm doing. My family could not handle it. Could not handle me giving a tithe, giving money away to the church and serving and maybe even missing some things because I wanted to make a difference for God. And um, there, Jesus... There's a reason why Jesus, in Matthew chapter 12, yeah, it's not your, like, no, I, got, I got a handout and stuff like that. But in, in Matthew chapter 12, do you remember the story when Jesus was teaching his disciples and, 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 and the crowd and, and he's preaching and his mother and brothers come outside the house and they're waiting for Jesus and they're like, Jesus, take a long time, man. And we hadn't seen Jesus in forever and stuff. And, and then they get Simeon, and they're like, can, can you tell Jesus, like, mama's here, brother's like, come, come, come on, come, come home. Or can we spend some time with you, son? And Simeon goes, like, Jesus, your, your mom, your mother, and your brother's out there. They, they've been waiting for you. Do you remember what he said? Do you remember, you guys? Who is my mother and my brother? And then he points at his disciple, and he says, these are my mother and my brothers. What a hard concept for people who are not followers of Jesus, who Jesus is pointing at, to comprehend and to understand. And I want to speak to that identity that I believe will help you in, in maybe some of the challenges you're experiencing as, experience as a servant of God around people who might not understand or speak against what you give and what you sacrifice and why maybe you cannot step out of the house and satisfy an expectation that a man has or a person has or a family member has or some relative has or another has on you over what God has on you. Am I preaching too hard on you guys? Are you guys okay? Here's, here, here's the, the, the bottom line truth. That, that I want to drive home. Who you are is more important than what you do, Dream Team. Who you are is more important than what you do. And all of you do so well, and we're celebrating that, but, but more than just celebrating what you do, I want you to know that we're celebrating who you are. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's, let's talk about new creation Theology is so important for you to understand the, the who and not just the do. You got to understand who you are because the reason why some of you won't be here next Dream Team rally or next year at the same time next year isn't because there was something wrong with the doing and someone did it wrong or did it wrong to you and you didn't do it right. It won't be that. It will be because you didn't know who you were. Okay? You didn't know who. So, so, so this is, you, you don't understand what, what, what Jesus meant when he was sitting in the room pointing at you. He said, you're my, you're my mother and brother. You don't understand truly what it meant to be new, a new creation. That Jesus wasn't just a part of your life or just to make your life better or added to your life. But, but he, was, he, he came to do something absolutely transformative, different, powerful, that he would call it new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 and 17 so now, from now on, Paul says, we regard no one from a, what? A worldly point of view. So from now on, on this side of faith, 
I don't look at people the same way. I don't see people from the, from the perspective of this world. The, my vantage point has changed on this side of Christ, on this side of salvation, on this side of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't see people from a worldly perspective anymore. Though once I regarded Christ that way and I just assimilated him to my life and I just thought he was gonna make everything better, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old, everything up to that point is gone. And something new, this is what Jesus came to do, something new has come. This is, this is what you need to grab to a new depth. You need to grab your identity, your new creation identity. In Christ, Galatians chapter 6, 15 actually says that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Let me, let me, because this is like, okay, this is the law and the Gentiles, the not law. They're just like, don't even know God's law. So you can put anything in there. You can, this is like, you know, whatever you think, obeying a rule, whatever rule, and you're not obeying the rule. Like, you're going to do it right, you're going to do it right. You do this, you do that. They say, this church says that, and this church says that. They people say that, but... What actually counts is the new creation, he says. Like that, that doesn't, it's, it's actually, what, what really counts here, the Apostle Paul says, is the new creation. That's, that's what counts. How powerful is that? What is that? What's the new creation? Romans chapter 12, 1, 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Something's got to die holy and pleasing to God. This is true, your true and proper worship. Don't conform anymore to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be metamorphosized, be, be, be something br brand new by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 2.15. I'm just giving you some, some new creation theology scriptures, okay? His purpose was to create, Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one what? What a concept. If we truly grasp that outside of the, I don't know, the religious frameworks that we've created, let's, let's, let's look at this plainly, simply. Jesus' purpose for coming was not just to improve life and make life better and help your marriage and all that stuff. That is a result of why he came. The purpose of why Jesus came was to create in himself one brand new race. You know, I looked up the definition of a race. Webster's dictionary says, a race is a large body of persons who may be thought of as a unit because of common characteristics. That's what a race is. So, so let, me give you, let me give you the journey of our race, of humanity. It started with the original race, the original human, right? That's, that's who? Adam. Adam. That's, that's where it all started. The human race started in the Garden of Eden, when God breathed the breath of life into Adam. But Romans chapter 5, 19 says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many were made righteous. Jesus, throughout Romans, is seen as a parallel of Adam. That Adam brought sin in the fall, but Jesus brought righteousness, salvation, in the kingdom. So this is the, the original race. God, God created Adam, he called him man. This is where mankind have come from. But as you read through Genesis, God sovereignly chooses one man from one family. What's his name? What's his name? Abram, right? Or Abraham, right? So this is, this is number two, write it down, the Hebrew race through Abraham. 
No, no, this is, this is the Hebrews were, listen to me, guys, the Hebrews were not a people. They were not a people. He was, he was a, a Chaldean from Ur. He's just like, he's not, a, a, Abraham was from a, a different race. And God plucked Abraham from those people, made a covenant with him, and said, I'm making you in a new people. You're going to be my new people. And I'm going to do something in you. I, I, even in your old age, you're going to be like the sands of the sea. You're going, to be, you're going to be blessed and will be. Look what he says in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abraham, go from country, your country. Go from your country. Someone say, go from your country. Okay, this is what he's telling. Get out of that place. Your people and your father's household, all that. The, the, you're not them anymore. You're not that anymore. You don't belong there anymore. And, and, and I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to show you where you belong. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And here, sovereignly, through covenant relationship, God picks Abraham out of his family and says, you're a new race. I'm making the Hebrew nation out of you. Are you seeing that? This is what happened. This is what happened. All of it is just a mirror. Both the creation of man and the covenant of Abraham and how he called him out was a mirror of what God was always intending to do in, in his kingdom and in eternity. So write down number three, because there is a new race called the church. The ecclesia is what it's called. You ever heard that word in church, right? I preach that, ecclesia, Greek ecclesia. In the original context, the word ecclesia was used um, to describe a gathering of citizens who were called out from the rest of the population to participate in like the governing political life of the city. The idea was that these individuals had a special status and responsibility within the community. The word chosen by God, ecclesia, of whom Jesus literally said, I will build my ecclesia, the church, refer, refers to a community of people who were called out from the world to belong to God. A large body of persons who may be thought of as a unit because of common characteristics. The church qualifies this definition by Webster's Dictionary. The church is a large body of persons who are thought of as one unit, although different arms and parts of common characteristics by the fruit of his spirit and the fullness of his spirit. See, God sent his son to be a model after whom all of this new race would be patterned. He was called the firstborn among many brethren. A new race, his sons and daughters. This new race is not defined by ethnicity or culture or language, but rather by the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. Even, even Jesus, when he called the, the, uh, his disciples, he actually appointed 12 and separated 12 unto him, himself, and he called them what? Apostles. You didn't know this is a Bible class today, okay? But you need this. You need this, because when you leave... Like, I, and I'm going to pray for you in a moment that your identity would, would just in Christ and who you are in Christ would be, would be so grounded and unshakable. That he called them apostles. So do you know what, do you know what apostle was in the time like Jesus said it? Because I mean that term has been used different, different times in history. But in the time Jesus said, you'll be my apostle. You know what apostle was? An apostle was used by Greek and Roman culture. What the, what the Romans would do, they would send an apostle on an envoy of ships to lead with all of the necessary components to establish, listen to me, the culture of the kingdom in a new territory and set up a new culture that would infiltrate and be a model for all the regions of the land that they were going to. Jesus intentionally called his apostles this, he used a term that was not a part of Hebrew language. It wasn't 
Aramaic, he used a term that the Romans coined to call these 12 people that were going to establish a new culture, a new kingdom that would, inf- that would affect the world to be a model of change, a model of a, a new race. So, so when you get here, okay, here's the scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy what? Did you not see it there before? I hope you do now. You're a nation, a, a people belonging to God, You're a, a God's special possession. He chose you. You're his sons and daughters. You are royalty. You're my royal priesthood. You are a nation. God, just like he did to Abraham, saw you, chose you, plucked you out of this world, out of your mess, out of my brokenness, out of my shame, out of my... And and, and he he made me new. He made you new. He called you out of the land out of your family. And I'm not saying that we do away with all other cultures, race, and ethnicities. I'm not saying that. There's value in that. But I'm saying what, that this race that Jesus established, that doesn't matter. So, when someone asks you, you know, what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your ethnicity? Where are you from? You're filling out that form. You're filling out the form. You know, what's your, I'm a Christian. I belong to the kingdom of God. This is who I am. I belong to his church. This is my identity. This is who he says I am. He's not just added to your life. And this is why. This isn't like, this isn't just something nice to do to serve people, to be on the team and fun. It's who we are. This is who we are, guys. We are children of God. Some people won't understand that. They won't understand the sacrifice. They won't understand this new creation. They won't understand your identity. That's okay. Shine anyway. Serve anyway. Sacrifice anyway. Love them anyway. I hope that that you'll be here this time next year. I hope that you'll be here next season. I hope that through the long haul that and this is just as a pastor, it's just like I know this is from a pastor's heart. I mean, I've seen so many people fall back into stuff. We're all human, I get it. And I'm not saying like you, you're going to be perfect or anything like that. But just most of the time, the, at the root of that, of the reason why they fell back into something and went back to something, because they didn't know who they were. See, that that man's dead. That old Jason is dead. That life is gone. That life has nothing. And, And so when crisis and difficulty and challenges come, oftentimes the, you, you kind of, you fall back into something, right? You fall back into maybe a habit or a pattern or the comfort zone. You go back to what I have found when I've, when I've lost my mom or my dad or my brother or I'm going through crisis and difficulty. I, I, when I fall back, I, I fall back into him. That, he's, he's like my, my beginning point. 
Jesus is, was the beginning of my life. Beyond that is dead. It's gone. And so when, when crisis hits and you fall back to, into anything before Jesus, it just shows me, it shows me, it reveals that you just, you, you don't understand this new creation thing. It never really became alive inside of you. You never got it. Nothing, it didn't click the way it needed to click. If you can go back to something before Jesus and act like you never even knew Jesus and live like you didn't know Jesus, like, like you just, you didn't get it. It's not who you are. I love what God is doing in this church. It's beautiful. It is really beautiful. This, one of the recent podcasts I, I recorded was uh, about culture and influencing the right culture. And so I, I've spoken to a few large churches, some of them bigger than, than ours here in these last, this last month, to help them with their culture. And I'm, I am so grateful for this church and for you and for our team. The culture that, that we have here is beautiful. When people come onto our campus, they feel it. When they, when they just around you, they feel it. And I was talking to some other churches and I know like, I don't compare and I'm like that, but I was grateful. I was grateful because when you step around some of those campuses and people, you feel something different. And uh, and I, oh, I want you guys, we here, listen, we're family. You are my brother, my sister. Mother, fathers are right here. I'm not so going to get, like, you do have brothers and sisters and fathers. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying this, it, this is what Jesus came to do. This is... This is what he came to do, guys. He came to make a new people, a new race. It's who we are. This, this ecclesia. So here's, uh, can you do me a favor? Can you like grab, like, like, can you grab the person next to you? Maybe just like lay a hand on and, and grab a hand next to you. I want to, I want to pray for the protection of this culture, this identity in this church. But I also want to pray for you that you get this. Something today would click deep in your soul. Can we do that right now? God, I thank you. I thank you, God, for calling us out of our mess, for revealing who you are to me. I was broken and lost and confused. I was ashamed and filled with guilt. And Jesus, you rescued me. You rescued me, Jesus. You set me free from my sin and my shame, from my past, you called me yours. Forgive us, God, for playing church, for sometimes going through motions and flowing with our culture and not understanding that this life is a mist and a vapor and we exist for your kingdom, for your glory. God, I pray that you would deepen in our soul the understanding of who we are, the purpose of why you came. Our identity as new creations, royal priesthood, a special possession belonging to you, God, a holy nation. 
God, and as we link our arms, I pray that you would knit together as a unit, a body, a family, a race, together called out by the supernatural, transforming power of the resurrection, the covenant that we have made with Jesus that took us out of darkness into light, that we together, God, make up your church. Your church is not a building. It's not a denomination. It's this family. God, I pray that we would treat it differently. Our brothers and our sisters. I pray that you would make strong and tie the fabric of our culture, of our unity, of our fellowship. May love, the love that is here, the love that is between this family, may it be a beautiful testimony of your kingdom, a love that doesn't exist here in it, on earth except through the manifestation of your kingdom. God, let us be a reflection of that. That in this family there is forgiveness. In this family there is grace. That in this family there is love. In this family there's unity. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I pray that you would erase our past. Erase the, the man I was before, the woman I was before. Erase it, God. That when it gets hard, and when it, I feel like giving up, and there are going to be times we do, God. I'm not a failure in those moments. Help me to remember that. But when I do feel like giving up, God, I want to fall into you. I want, I want to fall to this place where I began as a son, where I began as a daughter, in, in the arms of my father. No more turning back. There's nothing beyond the cross. There's just Jesus. Thank you, God, for creating a new creation in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.